Welcome everybody to Psychology. I apologize for not being able to be with you today. So I've prepared a recording of the lecture that you would be receiving normally. And hopefully you'll be able to follow along and use it to help you better understand the later sections of our social psychology unit. At the end of this, we'll be using the time to watch a video and complete a short handout that is posted for you on Canvas. So our warm up for today would have been, would you rather be a member of a championship team or the champion of an individual sport? And it, either way, which sport? So at this point, we can pause the video and go around and share out the answers so that we establish a good class culture, getting to know one another and hearing more about other aspects of who we are. All right. Having paused the video, if you chose to do so, uh, if not, we'll just continue on. This week, the asynchronous people, this would be the A and the AC cohort, will leave the Zoom and work on their social psychology project that is posted for you on Canvas. Your homework over the weekend and all next week includes continuing to work on the social psychology project. You'll have another week to finish this, because it includes not only a written assignment, but also a video component. And the video is very open-ended, so feel free to be as creative as possible. But check out the rubric that's also been posted for you on Canvas. The B and the BC cohorts will stay here, and you'll, can, you'll be walked through the lecture on relationships and attraction, followed by completing the exercise known as the lunch date. For the B and BC people, we'll use this time to do a little warm-up connection and retrieval practice by completing the fill-in-the-blank sentence. People tend to marry someone who lives or works nearby. This is an example of the blank, blank, blank in action. Pause the video and share out your answers. Volunteer to fill in the blanks to the best of your ability. The answer to the fill in the blank is the mere exposure effect. People tend to marry someone who lives or works nearby. This is an example of the mere exposure effect in action. Right now, I'd like you all to open up your laptops and take out your homework that you did for last Monday called Social Psychology Reading Questions Number 3. You're going to be given some time to turn to a neighbor and share out your answers and discuss your different responses to the first three questions. Question number one, bystander intervention. According to Darley and Latane's research, what is the three-step process that needs to happen in order for a person to help in a given situation? Number two, what is the bystander effect? Can you think of an example from your own life when you observed this effect? And number three, what are a few of the factors that make it more likely for a person to help or intervene in a situation? Pause the video now and discuss for the next three minutes. Then start the video again and we'll go over the answers. Starting now, again, after having discussed with your neighbor, let's go through the questions. Number one, according to Dahlia and Latane's research, what is the three-step process that needs to happen in order for a person to help in a given situation? The answer is that uh, they need to notice that there is a emergency, they need to acknowledge that it is an emergency, and they need to feel responsible for taking an action. Number two, what is the bystander effect? And can you think of an example of your own life when you observe this effect? The bystander effect is actually defined for us on this slide right here, where it says this is the tendency for any given bystander to be less likely to give aid if other bystanders are present. Some possible answers could include that when a teacher asks a question of the class, generally, the bystander effect leads students to not respond, thinking that someone else will answer the question instead of them. Another example could be that while driving on the highway, 
We've all seen an example of a car broken down or perhaps even an accident by the side of the road. Rarely do people actually pull over to stop and help people whose cars have broken down, assuming that the ambulance or the tow truck is on its way. A very famous incident of this occurred with Kimmy Genovese, a young woman who was living in New York City in the 1970s. Kimmy Genovese was walking home late one night and was attacked by a random murderer and rapist. He grabbed her, dragged her into a nearby alleyway, and not only raped her, but stabbed her repeatedly to death. The shocking murder and rape was witnessed by over 30 people from their windows overlooking the alleyway. No one called the police. Even when Kitty Genovese was screaming for help, no one took action. This terrible, tragic murder is an example of the bystander effect because everyone who observed the murder thought someone else would call the police instead. It leads us to conclude that if we are ever in a similar situation where our life is in danger, it's best not to call for help, but rather to call fire. By shouting fire, the bystander effect will be neutralized as people will feel that they are going to be impacted by the emergency. Calling for help triggers the bystander effect because people tend to assume someone else will be responsible. Lastly, what are a few factors that make it more likely for a person to help or intervene in a situation? Here are some of the answers from your textbook. The person appears to need or deserve help. The person is in some way similar to us. The person is a woman. We have just observed someone else being helpful. We are not in a hurry. We are in a small town or rural area. We are feeling guilty. We are focused on others and not preoccupied. We are in a good mood. We're going to slip over the rest of these for time and begin to talk a little bit about the lecture that Ms. Kim prepared for you in which I've added a few additional elements to make it a little deeper for your understanding. This is the Psychology Relationships and Attraction Lecture. Relationships. Humans are social animals. Social bonds are created for survival. Relationships offer self-esteem. Self-esteem is the measure of how valued and accepted we feel. But our relatedness must be balanced with autonomy and competence. That means that our relationships with others have to be balanced with our ability to feel free and independent, autonomy, as well as competence, that we are giving as much as we are receiving from this relationship. Lastly, we tend to create belonging and friends through our relationships. And these relationships, these friendships, this belonging leads to conformity as we attempt to preserve those relationships. Some threats to relationships that we've all been experiencing since the start of this pandemic would be increases in anxiety, loneliness, jealousy, and guilt when something threatens our social ties, as we've all experienced through social isolation as a result of the pandemic lockdown. Another example of threats to relationships include ostracism, which is defined as social exclusion. This is often used as a form of punishment. You may have been given a time out as a child, or it might be familiar with our prison system in which people are ostracized and excluded from society as a form of punishment. Studies have shown that ostracized people typically become isolated and can get even more aggressive. This would lead us to question whether our prison system, which ostracizes and isolates individuals, is actually reforming their behavior or increasing the likelihood that if you are imprisoned, you will act out in an aggressive manner in the future. Could it be that our prisons are creating more criminals, not fewer? Then, if we scan the brains of prisoners, it shows a similarity to the people who are experiencing real physical pain. In short, when we put a prisoner into solitary confinement, we have to understand that it's actually a torture device in terms of brain psychology and not a reform element that's going to lead to greater conformity and obedience to the law. 
In reverse, however, it's important to note that belonging can activate brain areas associated with rewards as well as satisfaction and even dampen pain. A good example of this would be members of the military who sacrifice themselves going through physical hardships and even death because of their sense of belonging that they receive from being part of the military and serving their country. In your textbook, there was a very adorable picture of a very rare white penguin born at the Sydney Australia Zoo, who was ostracized by his peers because he didn't have the same familiar black and white markings as other penguins. The zookeepers thought that they would need to dye this rare white penguin black in order to, for him to have healthy relationships. But after only a few weeks, the other penguins overcame the difference and accepted the rare white penguin. Connection. Relationships are all about connection. In the world, as quote, in, at least in 2015, there were 7.4 billion people, and 7 billion of these people have cell phones. That's an amazing and unprecedented level of connection never before seen in human history. In the United States, teenagers spend nearly 30, or say they send nearly 30 texts or snaps each day on their cell phone. And 94% of American college students use social networking sites. I'm going to pause the video now and you'll turn to a neighbor to discuss your own connection habits. On average, how many times do you connect with other people online or using social media every day? Pause the video now and discuss this. After having discussed this, let's now raise our hands and see how frequently we compare our usage to others. Raise your hand and keep it raised if you send 30 texts a day or snaps or any social media contact. Keep your hands up. Look around. Keep your hand up if you send 40 texts or snaps a day. Keep your hands up if you send 50 or more snaps each day. Feel free to pause the video if you want to discuss this outcome. In your textbook, there was a funny cartoon that I wanted to share with you. It says, do you, funny or at bizzone.net, take Harley 99 at comico.com? And the tagline being that they met online. Connections today are more frequently done online. Some of the effects of social networking include that lonely people spend more time online. However, the internet also offers more opportunities for new connections. The effects of social networking also include self-disclosure, the sharing of ourselves. When this is all done online, people can be less self-conscious and inhibited. This also can be taken to extremes. One example of this would be sexting. Narcissism is also an effect of social networking. This is known as self-esteem gone wild in a sense. Narcissistic people have the highest usage of social media. Take for example, Kyle, Kendall Jenner, who has 31 million Twitter followers. A short review of her Twitter feed would show her narcissistic tendencies. How to maintain balance and focus in a social media age. One, monitor your time. Two, monitor your feelings. Three, hide from distracting friends or things when online. Four, put the phone away when studying. Five, try a social media fast. If you're not able to put your phone away for a week, you may have a problem. Six, refocus yourself by going outside. Here's a discussion question. You should pause the video and turn to your neighbor and discuss your own relationships at this time. Discuss and think about your relationship with two different people. Examples could be a family member, a close friend, a cousin, a romance, or whatever. Why are you drawn to these particular people? Pause the video for a minute now and discuss. And then feel free to share out to the level of your comfort with the rest of the class. Once the conversation is over, we start the video. 
three ingredients to liking or attracting others would include proximity, physical attractiveness, and similarity. Here's a cartoon from your text. Just look at how he stoops over and the adorable way he drags his knuckles and that jutting jawbone. Isn't he just perfect? And another from your textbook. I'd like to meet the algorithm that thought we'd be a good match. Let's dive a little deeper into the three aspects of attraction. One is proximity. Being in close range to another person is the most powerful predictor of friendship. People are most inclined to like and to marry those who are nearby. This is an example of the mere exposure effect. The repeated exposure to novel stimuli that increases our liking of them. This works for faces, music selections, and languages. People are even more likely to marry someone whose name resembles their own. Online dating. Each year, an estimated 30 million people search for love online on one of 1,500 dating sites. This expands the pool of people that they are exposed to. What's interesting is that internet phone marriages are, on average, happier and less prone to divorce. Online dating is now responsible for about one-fifth of all U.S. marriages. Pause the video and discuss whether you find this surprising or not. Do you know anyone who has met someone and married someone after meeting them online? And would you ever be open to online dating? Why or why not? Some findings about online dating. People who fear rejection often provoke more rejection. Challenges with online dating. Given more options, meaning more people to choose from, people make more superficial choices based on appearance, jobs, status, or rather than on personality. And men wish for future contact with more dates, while women tend to be choosier in selecting who they date. Physical attraction. Physical attractiveness reportedly affects our first impressions the most. Both men and women pay attention to this. Women are more likely than men to say that another's looks don't affect them, but studies show that men's appearance does affect women, especially in speed dating experiments like Tinder. Attractiveness also predicts how often people date and how popular they feel. And lastly, attractiveness is often equated with health, happiness, sensitivity, success, and social skills. Other findings include people's attractiveness is unrelated to their self-esteem and overall happiness. Strikingly attractive people are sometimes suspicious that achievements or praise for their work is more of a reaction to their looks than their abilities. For couples who were friends before a romantic relationship, looks tend to be much less important. Similarity. Shared attributes, beliefs, and interests are often what pull a couple together. In short, opposites do not attract, or at least not in long-term relationships. Other factors that influence attraction would be that we like those who like us. The reward theory of attraction says we will like those whose behavior is rewarding to us, including those who are both able and willing to help us achieve our goals. Now, passionate versus compassionate love. Passionate love is the intense desire to be with a partner, intense, positive state of feeling fully absorbed in another person. This happens when blood flows from the brain region linked with cravings and obsession. This is a temporary feeling, and the key ingredient is arousal, when chemicals in the brain like dopamine and adrenaline are given off. Adrenaline makes the heart grow fonder. If you are aroused by an activity, for example, you're more likely to find someone else attractive and therefore fall in love. As love matures, however, it typically becomes a steadier, compassionate love, which is a, dif a different feeling from passionate love. 
Compassionate love is deep, affectionate attachment. After the dopamine and adrenaline give way to a new brain chemical known as oxytocin. This is a hormone related to trust, calmness, and bonding. For example, in non-Western countries where people rate love less important for marriage, there are lower rates of divorce, showing that the Western tradition of passionate love or the romantic type of love is often a very poor guide for making a long-term match. In non-Western countries where arranged marriages are more common, they're more popular because they lead to a more compassionate love match where the love will be long-lasting and not short-term. The key to satisfying and enduring relationships are one, equity, where both partners receive in proportion to what they give. Two, self-disclosure, revealing intimate details about ourselves. This is the end of our lecture. Pause now and see if anyone has any questions, and then restart the video. Now we'll take a turn to watch a short video called The Lunch Date. In Canvas, there is a handout waiting for you to complete based upon your observations of the film. There are even some discussion questions that you can use after you watch the film. I will send a link to who was ever covering the class for them to start the video at this time. Good luck, everyone.